In this video, we want to talk about loop-independent versus loop-carried dependencies. This will help us decide which iterations of which loops can be executed in parallel. A loop-carried dependence means a dependence exists across iterations. If you take out the for statement before the loop, then the dependence no longer exists. For a loop-independent dependence, the ex dependence exists within an iteration, so if you take out the loop, the dependence would not change at all. It would still be there. We've got an example over here with three nested loops. The first loop has two statements in it. There's a loop carried dependence of state of the i plus first iteration of this of this two statement loop with the ith iteration. The reason for this is that a value that's used on the i plus first iteration is in fact calculated on the ith iteration. That's because each iteration uses the value of a, or uses an element of a, that was calculated on the previous iteration. Also, we see that a sub i is computed here and used there. So this means that statement s2 is dependent upon statement s1 finishing before it. But this is a loop independent dependence because if you take out the for statement, it's still there. You still need to finish S1 before you can overwrite the value of A sub i. Now in S3, notice that there is a subscript of J on the left-hand side and a subscript of J minus 1 on the right-hand side. This means there's a loop carried dependence on J because a value that's written in the J minus first iteration is going to be used on the Jth iteration. But there are no dependences in the i direction. One iteration, the ith iteration, uh, the ith row does not depend upon the i plus first row or the i minus first row. So we could actually compute all of the rows in parallel here. In the fourth statement, which is actually in the third loop, there's no loop carry dependence on j because j doesn't change. The subscript j doesn't change from the right-hand side to the left-hand side of the statement. But there is a loop carry dependence on the 4i loop because the ith row depends upon values computed in the i minus first row. And so we could do all the columns of this loop in parallel, but we can't do the rows in parallel because of that dependence. Two kinds of graphs can help us see these relationships. First is the iteration space traversal graph, or ITG. It shows the order of traversal from one iteration to another. Here, a node represents a point in the iteration space. In other words, a node represents uh, a set of i value and a j value, like i equals 1, j equals 2. And a directed edge indicates the next point that will be encountered after the current point is traversed. So here we see statement S3, which says a sub i j equals a sub i j minus 1 plus 1. Well, actually, as far as the uh, iteration space traversal graph is concerned, what matters is not what's in S3, but rather what's in the four statements. Uh, I goes from 1 to 4, but while I is going from 1 to 4, J is going from 1 to 4 for each value of I. So we start out with, a, uh, with I equal 1, J equal 1, and then we go to I equal 1, J equal to 2, i and j are 1 and 3 respectively. Now i and j are 2 and 1 in the next iteration of the loop. And it just goes on like that. A loop carried dependence graph shows the various dependence relationships graphically. Again, a node is a point in the iteration space. In other words, in this two-dimensional graph, it's a point in the i, j space, value of i and a value of j. A directed edge represents a dependence. What this shows us is that the iteration 1 comma 2 for i and j is dependent upon the iteration 1 comma 1. And that's because in 1 comma 2 with i equal to 1 and j equal to 2, we use a value that's computed in the uh, i j equal 1 1 iteration where we're looking at a sub 1, j sub 1. So that's why we have this edge from 1 1 to 1 2. And this is a true dependence because the value that was computed in the previous iteration of j will be used in the current iteration of j. So we see dependences in this direction. We don't see any dependence from 1, 3 to 2, 1 because we don't have any dependences there. The dependences are all along the rows. They're between the columns and the rows. There are no dependences between this row and this row. 
Here we have another example involving two nested loops. The first loop is a 4i, 4j loop that has a four-point iteration statement in the middle of it. In other words, what this does is it computes the value of a sub i j by summing up all the neighboring points, the ones above and below, and to the left and to the right. Because this is the same 4i, 4j pattern that we saw before, because we have the same 4i, 4j pattern that we did before, the iteration space traversal graph is exactly the same. We do the 1, 1 iteration followed by the 1, 2 iteration followed by dot, 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 the 1n iteration followed by the 2, 1 iteration, and so forth. Now let's look at the dependence relationships so we can draw the loop dependence graph. As far as true dependences are concerned, there are two of them. The value of S1ij is used as an operand in computing S1 of ij plus 1. Note this subscript here. The j minus 1 subscript indicates that it's using the value that was computed in the previous iteration of j. There are no output dependences because there's only one statement in the loop. And the anti-dependences actually are exactly the same. And the reason for that is that we have these j plus 1 subscripts, which means we've got to be sure that we don't overwrite the next value, the, the, the uh, value at the point to the right, before we use it in our current computation. So one thing that's interesting to note is that the true dependences have exactly the same form as the corresponding anti-dependences, only that these have a t there and these have an a. And that means that when we actually look at the loop dependence graph, we will find that each edge represents both true and anti-dependences. In other words, the, the uh, iteration point to the right is dependent in both the true dependence and anti-dependence on the point to the left, as is the point below. Okay, so this raises an interesting question. Suppose we dropped off the first half of statement S1, so we have what's shown below. A sub i j equals a sub i minus 1 j plus a i plus 1 j. If we did that, which of the dependences would still exist? And then let's do the same thing, removing the last half of the statement. Then let's go on to the second loop nest right here. The value of a sub i j that's computed in S2 is used in the next, the, j, the next j iteration of S3. So that's a true dependence as shown here. The anti-dependence again is that b sub i j is used here and written there. So this read has to occur before that write. The loop dependence graph is pretty easy because there are dependences only in the jth iteration no dependences between the various rows, which means that all of the rows could be executed in parallel. So, why are there no vertical edges in this graph? Well, that's because there are no dependences involving i. So we could do the, I, the, the rows i in parallel. Why is the anti-dependence not shown on the graph? Note that the graph shows only the, the true dependence here. Well, the reason for that is because the anti-dependence is not loop carried. And because it's not loop parry, carried, it does not appear in the LDG because nodes represent all statements in the loop body. And so if there is a dependence between two of those statements, the dependence is within the node, not across nodes.